Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, those of you who have just arrived, welcome to the Literary Translation Centre. My name is Daniel Hahn, and I'm delighted to be chairing this afternoon's conversation. We're going to be talking about Brazil and about Brazilian writing and the, the fate of Brazilian writing when it leaves Brazil and comes to places like the United Kingdom, which has traditionally been uh, not the most hospitable of markets for Brazilian or indeed any writing, um, but which seems increasingly to, to be... Uh, welcoming, if not everybody, certainly Brazil. If you look at publishers' catalogues for the next year or so, you'll see a huge kind of flourishing of Brazilian writers, some of whom a lot of us have known about for a really long time and UK publishers are kind of discovering now. And they say things like, oh, have you heard about so-and-so? And we kind of go, I sent you an email about him in 2006. You've never answered. But there, there does seem to be, we do seem to be at this moment for a number of reasons which, which we will discuss, a moment to which uh, Brazilian writing is suddenly in very large numbers finding its way into the UK and the US market. We're going to be talking about uh, why that is happening. Um, there are a number of reasons we know about, there may be other reasons we don't know about. Um, brief introduction to the people who are on the panel with me. To my immediate left, I was, this is Margaret Jill Coston. I was standing with her earlier. We were going to make some notes about what to say, and my notes get as far as saying, Margaret Jill Coston, which I think says it all. This is Margaret Jill Coston. We have nothing else to say. She is, the only other thing I will say about Margaret, who's a translator from Spanish and Portuguese, is that Stefan sent me a, a translation a couple of days ago, a short piece she'd done of a, by a writer. I've translated a few of, a few of uh, whose books, um, and I got about two pages in and thought, the rest of us should just get out of the way, shouldn't we? I don't know why, frankly, we bother. We get out of the way and let her do all of it. Margaret is the translator of uh, Saramago from Portuguese, of Javier Marias from Spanish, and many others. And I'm not going to say any more because I will cry and it'll be embarrassing. Uh, next to Margaret is Fabio Lima, who runs the translation program at the Brazilian National Library, um, and who is responsible, I think, one of the people most responsible for getting all of these Brazilian books out to us. Um, we will talk about... Uh, how he is doing this, how this is happening. And at the far end is Stefan Tobler, who, has, who is here, I suppose, with two hats. One is as a translator himself, a translator from Portuguese and from German, um, but who is also the publisher of the founding publisher of And Other Stories, a brilliant publishing house which has been going for a couple of years and which is publishing its first Brazilian book this year and its second next year. So we have people with quite different perspectives on this subject. Um, and I'm going to start with, I suppose, just by asking... Um, Margaret and Stefan, that really basic question, which is how they got into, how they got their Portuguese, if you like, how, how they got this kind of point of access to the language. Um, I, you well, to I, justify yourself, explain okay, yourself. Okay, okay. Um, I, well, I did my, my degree in Spanish and Portuguese at Bristol several centuries ago, and, uh, and then I went to Portugal and I lived in Portugal is that, can you hear me? I li and I lived in Portugal for two years and I, I made a mistake. I married a Portuguese. Um, but that was had its uses. Um, but I've since, um, I got rid of him quite soon. And, and ever since then, I've been a translator. So you, got, you kept the Portuguese then? Yeah. Yeah. You got rid of the, 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 the husband and kept the language. <laughs> was that, because you've been translating for a while now, what, was it easy to get attention for Brazilian books specifically? Has, has, Brazil, has there ever been a moment when you felt that Brazilian books had a kind of way in? Well, I mean, I, I feel a bit of a fraud actually being here because I've translated very little Brazilian. And I mean, when I started, the, I think the only Brazilian I knew was Jorge Amado. He was the only, translate, only Brazilian writer who was um, translated, I think. And, mm. and he's I noticed he's still in print actually on Brazilian Penguin Classics. But, I mean, there was Jorge Amado, and I think Mashad de Assis had also been translated. Um, and that was it, really. So, and, and just getting Portuguese literature translated was very hard to start with. You know, so Spanish has always been slightly easier, I think, but Portuguese is always quite difficult, yeah. Did you try, uh, did, uh, with this... Sorry, I'd love to know what's happening. I'm, if everyone could just be quiet about it, we can listen to that event. No, it's obviously <laughs> going to be much more fun than ours. Um, did, did, you, did you try, did you see it as part of your job to read Brazilian writers? Did you try and find Brazilian writers? Or were, were your, was your job as a translator much more uh, reactive in a sense? You wait for publishers to bring things to you? 
I, th I think initially it was more reactive because, I mean, when you start out as a translator, as some of you will know, nobody takes any notice of you anyway. So um, I didn't actually take um, readers, writers to publishers. I did whatever they sent me, <laughs> really. But I, mean, I think now, I mean, because of you know, the, the wonderful thing that Fabio is doing, there's much more opportunity for Brazilian literature to be translated, and I think we should really grab it. You know, it's a wonderful chance. Thank you. Stefan, would you talk about your, your getting into this? this language and this culture? Um, I, I suppose, well, I was born in Brazil. My parents aren't Brazilian, but, um, but I was born there and uh, went to an American school there for a while as a child. So I didn't really speak Portuguese as a child, but I always was curious. And then uh, wanted to go back to Brazil, studied, so I studied Portuguese at university and then sort of never really, you know, lost touch, I think. There, there, was, there have been a lot of Brazilians in London for a long time. And... Uh, and that sort of that sort of led at some point then to to translating some poems and then uh, sort of becoming a translator. Uh, Am I right in thinking the first Brazilian novel you translated was the Clarice Lispector first full novel? Yeah, was that it? was not the the best, probably most cl cleverest place to start. But I, I had translated. If anyone some has read any Clarice Lispector in any <laughs> language? <laughs> she doesn't really write far. Portuguese. She writes no. her own language. Yeah. I mean, I had translated some other books from German, so luckily it wasn't my first book. <laughs> and were you aware, I, I'm going to ask Fabio what, kind of, to describe what's happened recently, but were you aware, sort of like me and I'm sure like Margaret in the last few years, of all of these things that were happening that no one was really paying attention to in the English-speaking world? Yeah, well, actually, that, that's, that's sort of why, why I wanted to get into the stories off the ground, because um, I think it was originally... I'd just been asking people for tips on good writing from Brazil and an academic at Oxford mentioned Hadwan Nassar uh, who you know is, is to a lot of Brazilians maybe the you know the, the best living Brazilian writer um, he's certainly very very much sort of if you ask writers that he's sort of very very popular but also more widely but completely and, untranslatable in that case yeah, yeah, well, he's, he's been translated into... He's published by Gallimard in France and Sorkamp in Germany. And, uh, and he was published sort of in the early 80s. And the, he, um, he never had found an English publisher. And I was then sending uh, samples to some English publishers. And because his writing is, is quite Baroque in a way, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's, it's not s straight, direct writing. And, and the subject matter is, is also, as with a lot of Latin American fiction... Uh, perhaps slightly risky for for some British publishers. There's there's all kinds of love that, that occur in some of his books, including uh, a, 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 I think uh, someone has an in a, a rather extreme affection for a ghost at one point. But um, <laughs> it's but his writing is absolutely incredible, and he really should be translated. So I was I was just frustrated that people weren't picking him up, and uh, that was a reason to get under the stories. Go. Of course, then the irony is that now. Uh, we said, can we translate you? And he's actually, I don't really want to be translated anymore. <laughs> he's, a, he's a real, he's a, he's, a, he's a lovely man. He's quite a character. <laughs> and he's a, he's a farmer. And he, he basically he wrote three books that were, were, you know, received as incredible books. Decided he was going to become a farmer and the whole literature thing was really, was really not for him. And he pre It's tempting. We've all thought that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Give up he went this translation it. nonsense. <laughs> Go and live on a farm. <laughs> I'm... I'm going to talk at a moment, I think, about what is happening in Brazilian writing and what are the exciting things that might be happening. Um, because Hadouan Assar is, is sort of a generation ago and there are a lot of things that are happening now, including a lot of very young writers. But I wonder whether, Fabio, you could start by saying something about specifically the role of the National Library Foundation in... Um, I think there are two things happening. One is there is a kind of push happening outwards from Brazil, and then there is also demand from the other places which we'll talk about. But can you say something about the role of the foundation in, in kind of pushing things outwards from Brazil? First of all, thank you for the invitation and everything. Uh, well, I think there has been a change the way the, the country, in other sectors, not only literature, has, been, has projected itself abroad. So talking specifically about the National Library and the translation incentives, I mean, this program, I mean, the basic translation funds, you uh, giving money to publishers so they can uh, translate books, uh, it exists since the early 90s. But since, I guess, uh, 2010, 2009, it, got, it, it became a permanent thing. And with a budget plan, like for the next 10 years. 
So I think that's a big change. You give the, the right sign. So, so if you invest uh, uh, in uh, Brazilian literature, you you'll be rewarded. <laughs> and uh, but also, I guess that's a change, you know. And also, but I guess the not only the public sector. I mean, the Brazilian uh, and the Brazilian cultural institution, but the private sector has uh, the Brazilian publishers. They have also made this movement abroad recently, and also it all it all come to one end, you know. So I guess it's uh, it also counts. Uh, but we started with this basic translation funds program, and we've de developed and we other other programs. So to really get uh, 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 maybe to support the whole chain, you know. And the, the, the thing I've learned is the best way to really, uh, I think, okay, the, the, we have been, we have good, good uh, many translations in Germany, for instance, because of Frankfurt Book Fair, which this year, uh, Brazil will be the guest of honor there. So that also helps. So people get interested. I want to have a book at, at, at Frankfurt Book Fair. So it, it just it spreads around, not only in Germany, but we've had the possibility to invest, I think the, the the most important, and I'm not playing for the crowd here or for the table. Uh, the the most rewarding, the most uh, enduring uh, uh, effect will be really uh, working closely with translators, really supporting the translators with either with grants, either with uh, workshops or residency programs, and that's the way we are uh, going to. I think that's the, the the main important thing, I guess. I'm glad you mentioned this idea of supporting the whole chain because one of the things that I think has differentiated the, the Brazilian funding from funding from a lot of places at the moment is not just that there is a lot of money and you're being very generous, but it's also being used, I think, much more smartly and much more strategically than it was in the past. Because one of the issues we've had in the UK for a long time is there may have been this great pot of funding for translators, but if people don't know what to publish or there aren't enough translators or there aren't readers or as a perception there aren't enough readers, then no publisher is going to be applying to this lovely pot of money that exists. And so one of the things that's changed, I think, is not just that there is lots of money, but it's actually that it's being spent in a much more sensible and much more strategic way. And supporting translators, he would say that, wouldn't he? It's obviously, obviously the most important. Everything else is less important, but that's obviously the most... Um, the most important thing. Is there a sense, um, you mentioned the Frankfurt Book Fair. So Brazil's gonna be the market focus, the Frankfurt Book Fair, it's gonna be the market focus in Bologna at Children's Book Fair next year. So these are opportunities from, a, from just a commercial point of view, these are opportunities on which to capitalize in a sense. But do we also feel like this is, there is actually exciting writing happening in the last few years that we didn't know about? Is there, is there something new happening? Or, is, or has there always been, you know, have we had 50 years of great Brazilian novel writing that we just have been too stupid to notice? Is this a special time for, for Brazilian writing? I think it's a special time, but there, there has always been <laughs> good literature. It's always been a special yeah, time. So, yeah, so this is Brazil, this where it's always yeah, a special yeah. time. Go to Brazil, always a special time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, advertising, that's great, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> well, what's happening now is, I mean, uh, as, okay, for, as I think writing in Brazil and uh, the growth of the editorial market and publishing companies, I think to become a writer is more a professional thing in Brazil. So, I indeed, I think there are more people writing. There's more people writing. And so uh, a lot of festivals and, and in Brazil... Sorry to interrupt, but also the publishing scene is... Yeah, exactly. Is, and then there's a, also a scene of book festival. Every, every month, every, almost every week, there's a, a festival, a literature festival in Brazil. So the authors go around, around the country. So it is a, a good time to, uh, uh, to be uh, writing in Brazil. So, yes, I guess it's a, a good time, yeah. Well, can I just say... Um, just recently, um, really since you know this program, this promotion of Brazilian literature, I've just um, I've translated one wonderful book by Diogo Mainardi, which is about his son um, who has cerebral palsy. It's a memoir rather than a novel, and I'm currently translating a novel by a novella by um, Michel Laub, um, Diario da Queda, and they're just very. I've. I just feel very excited about the new writers, you know, because they're, they're writers I wouldn't normally have come across, I don't think, and I think publishers here wouldn't have come across them. That's the wonderful thing, you know. So I, I just feel there is going to be a lot of Brazilian literature being published in this country and in America, which, you know, which is terrific. 
I just, yeah. Laub is one of the, the, the generation of 20 best young Brazilian novelists. You can just see the jacket over there from, the, from Grant, which Grant had published at the end of last year. 20 Brazilian writers under 40. Um, Stefan, w- were there people there, even someone who knows this area, were there people that you discovered through Grant? Is that kind of thing useful? Oh, I, yeah, definitely. I think anthologies are always useful because, uh, you know, there'll be names you don't know. Um, and, and the Granta list has, has some brilliant writers on. I mean, I think Granta Brazil makes a little bit, is, is a bit less representative in a way than the Granta Best of Young British because mm. no one knows the writers over 40. Mm. Uh, so to just focus on the ones mm. under 40 is almost a shame. I mean, there's incredible writers over 40 too that no that, one has heard about. That's old Brazilian yeah. novelists. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, I wrote a little bit about the whole. Well, I, I wrote a bit too much about the whole Grant anthology thing on the on the blog of uh, our publisher and other stories. So if you go to andotherstories.org, not dot com, which is a clothing company, but andotherstories.org, and then the bl- ampersand blog. If you're interested, I've listed a few of the people over forty who are, who are really worth looking up to. And if you're interested and in buying clothing, <laughs> go to andotherstories.org. Indeed, indeed, yeah. <laughs> Women's clothing and accessories. <laughs> It'll go to both. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I mean, personally, it's, it's an interesting question about, you know, what, what do you think about Brazilian literature now? Mm. I mean, I would, I would, my frank opinion is that Brazilian poetry is, has m- maybe a wider breadth and depth of riches than Brazilian fiction. Mm-hmm. Just, to, just to throw in a bit of controversy there. I think, I think Brazilian fiction is great. I mean, I read it very widely. Um, and say compared to say British fiction, I think it's just as great. I think there are some countries that maybe in fiction have a have an even stronger tradition. And again, I could be controversial here. Say for me, say Argentina. I think you know you can't you sort of just stumble across the amazing Argentine writers on every every sort of corner of a Argentine bookshop. I shouldn't say that here in front of you. Oh, sorry, I love, I love but I love Brazilian literature. literature. But they I, haven't I got think a very nice funding body who <laughs> gives loads of money. They're terrible. The not, I think it's lovely as well. no, no, I think it's strong, but, but I think yeah, also yeah. the poetry. I mean, that's the yeah. other thing with the Grant <laughs> anthology. It doesn't doesn't cover poetry or, or, or plays, and that's sort of I, that's something that people should really look into. There's incredible poetry from Brazil. Can you, can you name some? Well, I mean, it, <laughs> I I did a PhD on Brazilian poetry, partly just to find out who was out there, and <laughs> and I sort of set myself a task of choosing a poet from the north of the country because Brazil can be a little bit sort of. Cotteries and you know who you're friends with in Sao Paulo or Rio is, is the person you recommend to the you know the foreign academic and and uh, well and the novelists certainly cluster don't they mm. they're, they're in certain yes. areas yeah. the, 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 the kind of little Porto Alegre group and then there's yeah the so if you go to the Brazil stand you'll see a, a poet that Arc I think I saw Arc's publishers here earlier I don't know if they're still here uh, did a, a collection of this poet called Antonio Mora from the north of Brazil and uh, I'd recommend him, but there's so many other names. Um, it's very sort of hard to, to, to say a few. I mean... Does, does, does the funding cover poetry yes. as well? Yeah? Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, put poetry presses out there, I really, really recommend you look at. And then there are the classics who haven't been adequately translated yet. People like the, the Campos brothers who, who, who did visual poetry and then sort of Baroque, incredible language experiments, but also more recent poets who are... Who are Paul Lemieski, incredible writer. I mean, uh, would you say something, Stefan, about the the first Brazilian book you're publishing? Oh, I, well, of course, I'd would love you, to. Would, would you mind, as a publisher, would you mind advertising to this large audience? <laughs> well, if I must, if it's, if it's not too much trouble. <laughs> so the first one we are publishing, in fact, sort of came out of the poetry scene. He is uh, a writer, Rodrigo de Souza Leão, who was a poet for many years. Uh, and he actually was writing prose too, but no one really knew that for a long time. And he was friends with uh, all the poets, although he had met almost none of them, uh, because he, he, he had uh, mental health issues and he stayed in his house, uh, but he used Facebook, emails, the phone the whole time. So he actually sort of was, was he had so many friends. I, I mean, people who I didn't know were his friends, like Antonio Mora, the poet I translated, turned out that they all, all used to be on the phone to him and knew him. But um, so it's through sort of the poets that I heard about it first. Um, this book, uh, in Portuguese, it's Todos Cachorros São Zuis. In English, All Dogs Are Blue. 
And this is a autobiographical fiction, if, if, if you will. It's set in a mental asylum, uh, but there's a lot of things in there that which definitely didn't happen to him. Um, and it is, it is, I mean, I love it because it's on the one hand incredibly funny and it, and, and has, has the, the situations that occur are, are unbelievable at times. He, he, he has two good friends, uh, Rambo and Baudelaire, who are hallucinations of his. And Rambo, oh, Baudelaire is a bit boring, but he sort of puts up with him. And, uh, and Rambo, he, he really likes hanging out with, but gets him into a lot of trouble. So he, he doesn't always hang out with him. And there's, but it's also, as well as the, 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 the humorous side, and he has a, amazing, he's got a great way in one-liners too, about all sorts of things. He's very worried about sort of very down-to-earth things like his weight and, and the, the Rio funk blaring from the slums keeping him awake at night. So it's, it's very down-to-earth in many ways. But it's also a really, um, a really important document, I think, of, uh, of care for, you know, of care and medic, the, you know, medication given to, to mentally ill people. And it's, um, you know, and, and I think it's got a lot of interest in that because it's a very honest account. Um, but it's also hilarious to read. So there you go. I hope that's... <laughs> and anyway, so how it happened. But I, I should say how we found it. I, so I found it through poets who had recommended it to me. And, and I said, you know, what should I be reading? Should I be and mention a few big names? And they go, oh, it's all right, but read this guy. And, and I loved it. And that was a few years ago already. And then I'd sort of almost forgotten it. And, um, and then Sophie, our editor, who... Who, lucky Sophie, is living in Rio, uh, and uh, and does the editing from Rio. She, a friend, gave it to her, and she loved it too. So we then realised, well, okay, well, let's let's do it. We will find out quite soon uh, what English readers make of it because it's out in August. In August, great. August in the UK, September in the US. Thank you. I'd be curious to know what people think about the reception of these books or the potential reception of these books there, there has to be as I said at the beginning we talked a bit about, about the kind of push the incentives that come from Brazil but there has to be something in the market there has to be something in the culture or maybe there doesn't have to be I don't know that is going to make these works land well when they come to the English market is there I mean Margaret maybe I'll ask you this first do you think there has to be some kind of um, say cultural affinity but it's not quite that I I, I was talking to a biographer recently about a book he's writing about Brazil, and he's, he described Brazil as our kind of brick, as in B-R-I-C, as in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and Brazil is our kind of brick. Is there a sense in which somehow we are ready for Brazil, we know just enough about it, these books are not quite as frightening maybe as they would be from other places? I don't, I mean, the, the books I've been working on are, are really, they're not, in a way, they're not typically Brazilian. And maybe that's you know a, a good thing. Perhaps there's always a, I think like Michel Laub is is in a way a very European writer. He's based in Brazil, but he's writing about his Jewish, Jewish background Jewish. and about his grandfather who who survived the Holocaust, who survived Auschwitz. So he's talking about the European roots as well. And with Diogo Mainardi, he lives in Venice because he can't bear living in Brazil. <laughs> but, but I mean his book, yeah. and he, I know he's a great satirist as well of Lula, um, but. They, they seem to me, I mean, I think any book that's worth translating is one that speaks to every culture. Yeah. That's why it's world literature, you know. So whether it's because of the European roots in Brazil, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I recently for Granta, I translated a, a short story by Beatrice Brasche, uh -huh. um, which is about her visiting her brother's gold mine, you know, in the, in the interior of Brazil. And this, it's extremely alien material, for, you know, for us, you know, in, in uh, home counties. For those of us who don't have gold mines. <laughs> those of us don't. <laughs> but um, it's it's beautifully done, and it draws you in, and you feel like you have also visited a gold mine. And I think that's what great literature does, you know. And it, it and it you know it just steps right over all boundaries. That's why we translate in order to do that. I think. Yeah. And, just, and I think uh, publishers now are more open to literature, not necessarily Brazilian literature. I think uh, they have, I, 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 I wish, I'd like to wish, they have, they have overcome this necessity to have, is this Brazilian? You know, the, uh, I think there's, I think if you ask You're the writers, not Brazilian, yeah, enough, exactly, yeah. Right and if you, if you ask the, the writers, uh, you, is your literature Brazilian? They, they maybe get a bit offended by that. Mm -hmm. You know, because and I think they have overcome overcome that, and I think that's that's something good. It's a progress. Well, that's something that's interesting about something like the Granta list because it, you, you you desperately try to use it to define something, yeah. to represent something, 
and somehow this becomes what we think Brazilian writing is. And actually all it has in common is that these people happen to have, yeah. I imagine, Brazilian passports <laughs> dated yeah. after 1974. Yeah. I, I found that interesting when I was going, when I was researching writers in the north of the country, the Amazon region, and, and sort of expecting to find maybe that the people there were, were you know, writing very much sort of drawing on, as it were, local things. Hmm. And people, not just Antonio Mora, but other writers, they were very, you know, they were vehement. They didn't, you know, I'm not going to use a metaphor of a canoe in my poem just because I'm, just because I was <laughs> yeah. born here. I mean, come on, why? You know, they don't want to be sort of, sort of in a, a sort of a touristy, folkloric sort of pigeonhole. They're just writers. They might use something. They well, his so his book is is it's got a river in the in the title, uh, <laughs> but but you know, he's not sort of writing about. He's, yeah, they they feel they don't want to play to other people's expectations. Yeah. I think. Um. Would you say, I mean, this is for any of you, I suppose, are there particular writers or particular kinds of writer, I guess, who haven't made it, who haven't got their English language contract? Are there, are there people who you're really keenly aware we're missing still? Or, or to put it another way, you're hoping are going to find their way into English soon? Who are the, Fabio, I'll ask you first, who is your, who is your kind of... Who are, the, who are the writers you absolutely love who well, I mean, haven't quite been, well, I mean, we haven't the, noticed The yet. most uh, important Brazilian writer, it, of course, Machado de Assis. I mean, he's, yeah. uh, he hasn't, it's, it's incredible. He hasn't, he has uh, been translated, but not as, as much as I, I think he, mm. he deserves. And uh, so he's one, okay, the, the most classical, the, the, the figure, the representative figure of Brazilian literature, mm. Machado de Assis. But there's also, I mean, Dalton Trevisan, He's a short story writer, like a master of a short story. Mm. Has just won the Camon, Premio Camões last year, I guess. And he's also he's unknown around here. So, that was me? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you hope you've broken yeah. Earl's court. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, 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 I say Dalton Tre he's still alive, Dalton Trevisan, so he's a name I... I he, ha he hasn't written a novel. He, no, well, novel, no. He is not good at no, no, Adrian Lisboa, as we were talking about earlier, yeah. Adrian Lisboa is a brilliant novelist and a short story writer, but because short stories are, people are nervous for whatever reason of publishing, in some cases I'm generalizing, um, she's finding her way into the UK market, the kind of mainstream UK market, because there's a novel coming from Bloomsbury in yeah. October. And I guess, I'm oh, sorry, you were going to say something. I was just going to say, yeah, she's one of those just above 40, isn't she? Yeah. She, all, she didn't quite make the list. She, she would she's have still been, being sure. translated. Yeah, Fantastic. Just, yeah. Yeah. Still one, just we let the old ones in as well, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But I think um, you have a plan, don't you? For oh, well, we, we, we might do, yes. Yeah, no, we do want to uh, to start publishing more of the classics. Yeah, too, I mean, Machado de Assis is yeah. just wonderful. You know, yeah, yeah. One yeah. of the best ever. But also, um, Stefan was talking about José de Alencar. Yeah. Um, which I think is, you know, he's never been translated. I, I think yeah. Irasema, yeah, yeah, mm. and, and Guarana. Have you had a chance to start reading? Yes, yes, I have. Okay, train, yeah. but you're enjoying yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to do a little deal here. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to sign a contract. Yeah. Just talk amongst yourselves. But one thing that three percent, three percent, right? Yes. <laughs> one thing about in Brazil, there's a uh, strong tradition with short stories, which is different uh, around here. So uh, many excellent writers write only short stories so I think it's also a difficulty for a publisher to pick up a short story book you know mm -hmm. so th that's also the case and, and of course the you know the 20th century well the, the sort of two big biggest names probably in Brazilian literature in the 20th century again I'll, I'll, I'll annoy someone by saying this, but I, probably I suppose are uh, Guimarães Rosa and Clarice Lispector and Clarice Lispector you know, New Direction's done a fabulous job, and Benjamin Moser, who wrote a biography of her, of getting her out there. And I, Penguin, in, in their own good time, will be bringing those books out in the UK too. Um, but Guimarães Rosa suffers the, the difficulty that you need a translator to sort of have 10 years of his life free, yeah. or her life free to, to do it. And there's there's been a few there is people. a translation, but it's not very good. There's and there's a been 30 a year old yeah. translation, but it's, uh, yes, unspeakable. And, and, and it's sort of, I think for 20, sort of the last 20 years, people have been starting his, his, his big book, uh, which some people sort of, in a way, to a very loose comparison, people sort of say it's a Brazilian Ulysses, because it also has, you know, lots of play with language, he uses indigenous words. I mean, he knew about 20 languages himself, and he sort of has tremendous fun playing with languages. It's also a story set in the, the Northeast. And various translators have started and just said, actually, I've got, 
I think I still want to have a life. <laughs> so I, know, I know someone who has just started, by the way. We'll have this conversation in a moment. Um, we don't actually have very much time. We have uh, just under 10 minutes for some questions. So I'm going to stop uh, asking questions and let you ask questions. And if, here, and if you just wait for the microphone, please. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, where are the Brazilian publishers in the fair? Where are they? Yeah, some of them. The Brazilian publishers in Brazilian... Well, in the fair, I mean... Well, there's a stand right here. Which stand? This one. This one just yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. A few publishers are here, not, yeah. But, yeah. but how many stands? Just, just one. These one. Yeah. Just one? Yeah, one stand. It's a collective stand. It's a stand. collective stand with a lots of different stand. publishers. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, that's it. Thank you. Uh, yes, we should wait for the. Thank you. If we are an individual aspiring translator, how do we sort of, what do we do to somehow or other take advantage of this financing? I mean, what are, what are the best routes? I mean, who, you know, or intermediaries? Because obviously we don't come to you necessarily. Yeah. There needs to be intermediaries. Well. No, I guess, I mean, we have a, a residency program for translators, so a translator can come to Brazil and work in his, so that's a way, if you, uh, it's one of the ways, so it's a direct contact with the, with the foundation. But there are other activities, such as uh, we, we, uh, we work with, with BCLT, there was a mentorship program this year. With Brazil, there will be a summer school around uh, in June, in July. July with a Brazilian writer and Brazilian and translators of Portuguese, so that's one of the ways. So these sort of activities, promoting workshops, and that, mm. that's something that really works out, and we think that's a way for, especially for inspiring uh, uh, translators, I think that's a way to start. The other thing probably worth mentioning is, uh, people who are starting out in translation always get told that one of the ways of getting in is uh, writing readers reports for publishers, and this is particularly true, it's not always the easiest thing to do but it's certainly going to be true in the next few weeks because everyone who's been to the London Book Fair will have had Brazilian books thrown at them for three days um, this will be true in the days following Frankfurt as well in October where lots of publishers in the English speaking world are going to be uh, spending this fair and their, that fair being besieged by Brazilian publishers who want things published in English and these are all publishers who cannot read these books and they're going to be looking for people who can read them so this is exactly the moment to tell uh, every English language publisher you can find who is, could possibly be interested in Brazilian literature that uh, this is that, that you can read the books that they need someone to read and that's that's this is the moment for that or send a sample to a publisher that you think would be right for a book that you love I mean that, that's worth doing too I would like to take the opportunity to mention a few other authors that um, I think are absolutely essential to translate. For example, we mentioned Machado de Assis, and I'm a great Machadian. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow we have an exhibition of uh, his film, Postman's Memories of Brad Scubas at the embassy. I'll be doing the question and answer session. Uh, some years ago, we held a, a celebration of his centenary at the embassy. It was a week's celebration of Machado de Assis, and we have some materials and a DVD on Machado de Assis as well. And also, we have some uh, fabulous writers like Euclides da Cunha, who cannot be forgotten because his uh, uh, book was the basis of uh, another author, South American author, that used one of his um, characters, the main themes, and, and got a Nobel Prize. So <laughs> I will, I will uh, mention that. But Euclides da Cunha is very fascinating. Yes, uh, yeah, Euclides yeah. da Cunha is very fascinating as well because he wrote Paradise Lost with reference to Milton. And also, he was a major environmentalist, writing about very early in the century, in the 19th century. He had, um, uh, of course, he died very romantically. There was, uh, his wife uh, went out with somebody else, and there was a duel, and he got killed in that duel. But there are other authors that cannot be disregarded as well. There was a very important moment in Brazilian intellectual history, which is the uh, week of the modern art. 1922. Eight, uh, and this was a week where Macunaíma, Maria de Andrade, Oswald de Andrade, and all those people have written an amazing amount of things. It was a movement which was intellectual with 
architecture, culture, music, and everything together. But the week of the modern art has not been explored sufficiently and has not been exhausted. So there is a wealth of writers. And another thing that we did not mention, and forgive me, Fabio, but uh, I think we ought to mention as well, is the essay writing in Brazil. Brazil has a hugely sophisticated tradition in essay writing. And the essays that we have are absolutely amazing. And for the, uh, perhaps, the reader that is more interested, perhaps, in the history, we, what we have seen in Brazil as well is a wealth of publications about the history of Brazil and different takes on different aspects of the Brazilian history that I think is well, are well worth translating. And I'm sorry to be intervening, but I, <laughs> I'm, I'm a great you know, fan of, of Brazilian <laughs> literature, and obviously, I like it very much. And, uh, and I had, um, during the, the week of, uh, of Machado del Cis that we celebrated, we did a dramatic reading of one of his plays, which was uh, Snuffbox, Botte de Rapé, uh, which is now available at the Bodleian Library. There is a translation that was part of that, but it's mm. also available to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have so many things to read. <laughs> I wrote stuff down, though. I did write stuff down. It's so embarrassing. I haven't read anything. Um, uh, one more question. Can't see anyone waving at me. Over there. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm studying publishing here in the UK, and I was just wondering, this has not, nothing to do with translation actually, but um, I was wondering if you see a future market for bringing books in Portuguese to the UK or, or to Europe. Um, I've, I've been noticing that many people have been um, learning Portuguese over here, and there are many Brazilian people and Portuguese people coming mm. over here, and I was just wondering if there would be a market for books published in Portuguese around here. Stefan, can you imagine publishing another story, Portuguese language Portuguese editions here? It, it's an interesting question. I mean, um, I think it'd be easier for another stories to publish in Portuguese in Brazil rather than in England. I mean, because um, it's going to be a limited market. And I think there might be, you might want to look into what might have happened with, say, the Polish community, because obviously that's a very large community in the UK. And there's, there have been, I think, some publishers who have done bilingual editions but I don't think they've found, you know, massive readerships. I think it is, I think it's quite a, it'd be quite a toughie, yeah. <laughs> Presumably e-books would be the answer in a lot of cases, that it'll be a matter of e-books that are being produced in Portuguese somewhere else being available to readers here mm. without distribution costs, without risks and all those things. Yeah. Well, let's think, because I suppose people who read Portuguese in the UK, you know, it's, it is quite easy either as e-books or, or just to, to get from FNAC, PT or someone else, the actual hard copy. So, yeah. I mean, I think if you produce the books in Portuguese, you might as well sell them in, in Portugal or Brazil. <laughs> Thank you very much. Before, before we go, I'm going to ask Ellie Steele, who is over there, to uh, make a quick announcement. Um, do you want to go to the... Or would you like just grab the microphone behind you? Ellie is from the publisher Harvel Secker, who don't publish books in Portuguese, as far as I know, but do uh, have the two books which um, the two books which Margaret no, but not in Portuguese though. Um, but the, but the, the, the two books which Margaret is translating, the Brazilian books you mentioned, both of them, in fact, are being published by Harvel Secker over the next twelve months. Um, Ellie has an announcement for us. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, I'm delighted to announce this year's Harvel Secker Young Translators Prize. Um, it won't surprise you that our language this year is Portuguese. Um, and our entrants, who are emerging translators between 18 and 24 years old, will translate a story by the Brazilian author Adriana Lisboa, who they were talking about just now. 18 and? 24. So you have to be under, you have to be between 18 and 24. Under 25. Um, and, um, sorry, so the prize is in its fourth year. Um, our winners so far have been in Spanish, Arabic and Chinese. They've all gone on to great things, published in Granta, um, and Stefan has published our Spanish winner's translator, Beth Fowler. Um, and we'll be using Adriana's story, O Successo, which is about soccer. Um, she's a very exciting writer, as they've said before. Um, she's being published by Bloomsbury in the autumn, and the novel is called Crow Blue and is by all accounts fantastic. Um, 
My fellow judges are uh, Naomi Alderman, who was on the Grant of Breast of British yesterday, so congratulations to her. Um, also Margaret, who you all know by now, um, and the literary cricket, cri cricket, the literary <laughs> critic, um, Angel Guire Guintana, who's also a translator. Um, once again, our winner is going to travel to the Crossing Border Festival in the Netherlands, which is a fantastic initiative, um, and will participate in the BCLT mentorship um, with Margaret as their mentor. Um, there are flyers here, um, and there's more information at www.youngtranslatorsprize.com. Um, and you can go to the Vintage Books website, which is part of Random House as well. Um, and there you can download the story in the entry form. Um, and the deadline is the 2nd of August. Um, so all I should say is a huge thank you to Danny and Margaret, who've been completely wonderful helping me pick the author and the story and organizing everything. Um, to Naomi and Angel, to Adriana and her agent, Nicole Witt, um, to the BLC, BCLT, to Jessa at Crossing Border, and to the Literary Translation Center for, for hosting us today. Um, so good luck, please do spread the word, think about entering, um, and, and thank you. Thanks, Ali. Thanks for that. And do do tell young Portuguese translators and Portuguese translators to be about that. Um, oh, can I, sorry, can I say, I said 24 and I completely meant 34. Danny, I thought you're so. quite right for picking me up, so apologies was, for anyone. I was getting nervous. I mean, I was, I was feeling old anyway, but especially, <laughs> I thought. Yes, Thank 34. <laughs> Good. Um, that's okay then. So those of you who are between 25 and 34, I've got this like, little reprieve now, so you can in fact apply after all. Um, so thanks, Ali. So thank you all for coming. Before you go, please join me in thanking Margaret Costa, Fabio Lee, and Stefan Tobler.